John. Welcome, everyone. I'm so delighted to see so many people um, logging on tonight to participate in um, this tremendous salon. Um, before we proceed, I just wanted to thank, um, and I'm looking down because I want to get it right. I wanted to thank the uh, Miami-Dade County uh, Department of Cultural Affairs and the Cultural Affairs Council, a Miami-Dade County Mayor and Board of County Commissioners, uh, because in keeping with both the Betsy and FIU's commitment to access for all, we're really proud that tonight we're gonna be presenting this uh, event with closed captioning. Um, we've gotten a grant from the county to do that. I also wanted to thank the Ocean Drive Association and the City of Miami Beach, because FIU MBUS is an anchor organization of the City of Miami Beach and receives funding for these kinds of programs through their generosity. Um, and the Betsy's program, of course, uh, funded by the Betsy Community Fund at the Miami Foundation. So that was a lot, but thank you for giving me the time to, <laughs> to thank our sponsors. And now to say that um, I'm really delighted because I'm about four years ago, um, Jen Koretnik and Catherine Esposito Prescott uh, called us at the Betsy and had this vision to start an organization that focused on the work of women writers. And we're really interested in the Betsy in accessibility and diversity and inclusion. And so we've been a partner since the beginning and uh, MBUS is a partner to the Betsy in so many things that we do. So we're delighted to, uh, tonight to bring four years of celebrating women writers to um, a global community in four events over the next four Mondays. Well, tonight and three more Mondays. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the torch here to Catherine, who's going to introduce the readers tonight and her colleagues at SWIM. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you for having us. We are beyond delighted to be here. The Betsy has been an invaluable cultural partner. SWIM wouldn't be without the Betsy. And we have deep gratitude toward uh, FIU, MBUS, and Miami-Dade County Division of Cultural Affairs for making this possible. So when the Betsy asked us if we would um, put together a virtual salon, we couldn't say yes fast enough. You know, our mission at SWIM is to support and publish and amplify women's voices. To that end, we publish a poem a day at SWIM every day. You can visit us at SWIM, S-W-W-I-M.org. Hi. And you can also um, come and join us for our reading series. We also run this beautiful reading series at the Betsy Hotel um, in, in normal times, in pre-Zoom times. Pre-COVID uh, times, we would invite a writer to have a residency at the Betsy, and then we would pair her with a local writer as a way to foster community among writers, bring writers together, and bring more um, literary work to Miami. So that when people think about what do you go my to Miami for, it's not just to um, get drunk on the beach, but it's also to you know, be inspired in various ways. So we're thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Um, as Deborah mentioned, um, the event tonight will be closed captions. If you'd like to see the closed captions on your screen, you can go to the bottom, click on closed caption, and, and then highlight uh, show subtitles. If you don't wanna see the subtitles and you're seeing them, just click on hide subtitles. And if you'd like to view the transcript for the entire night alongside, you can also do that by clicking, I think it's a view transcript. And then um, once we get started, um, I think a lot of us are on gallery view right now, I am, which will be forever called Brady Bunch view. Um, but once we start, you may want to switch to speaker view so you can really see the poets, you know, in their habitat. How often do we get to see poets in their actual habitat? <laughs> but you may want to do that. So um, before we begin, I just want to highlight um, my colleagues at SWIM. Jen, can you say hi? Jen Koretnik and Carrie, Dad, Moro Gorlier, can you also say hi? We'll all be leading you through the event tonight, so you'll have time to interact with all of us. Um, so the format will be, we're gonna ask each poet to read. I'll introduce one poet, she'll read for about 10, 15 minutes. We'll stop, we'll introduce the next poet. She'll read for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll entertain a QA. and a And um, so if, when you, if you have a question during the reading, something comes to you, you wanna reach out, Go ahead to the bottom of your screen and um, in the chat section, please select um, Jen Koretnik and send her your question, your comment, your concern. She'll be um, moderating the Q&A. So if she could have all of that lined up, that would be super helpful. Of course, all of the co-hosts will be able to see um, you know, any chat messages that come through to us, but we may not be looking as often as Jen will be. So please send all of your questions to her. Uh, that would be fantastic. 
So without further ado, let's get to the poets. We're so delighted to bring you tonight Naoko Fujimoto from Chicago, from outside Hi. Chicago. <laughs> and then Miami's own Free Jemiki. Hey. Um, they were uh, supposed to be reading live um, in May. And we have to, you know, switch everything around. So um, we're delighted to bring them here to our inaugural Zoom poetry reading and salon. So without further ado, let me introduce Frisia. Frisia McKee is the author of uh, the chapbook, How Distant the City. Her words have appeared in Cream City Review, The Feminist Wire, Painted Bride Quarterly, Calyx, Gertrude, So to Speak, Nimrod International Journal, Bone Bouquet, Flyway, and the Ms. Magazine blog. Frisia's poetry is forthcoming in the Holland's Critic, the Antigonish Review, and the Grabbed Anthology. Her book reviews have appeared in South Florida Poetry Journal, Gulfstream, and The Drunken Odyssey. Frisia was the winner of Cut Bank Literary Journal's 2018 Patricia Gaudicke Prize in Poetry, chosen by Sarah Vapp. We're delighted, thrilled, honored to bring you Frisia. Frisia, please. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks to the Betsy and Swim. Thanks to Kim, our closed captioner. Thanks, of course, to Naoko. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us from um, wherever you're joining us from. Um, I'm going to put a link to my chapbook in the chat of Zoom if you want to support me as an artist. Um, and you can actually buy it directly from Books and Books, our local bookstore, um, instead of Amazon. Um, I'm going to read a poem by another poet to start, and then I'm going to um, read my own work. Uh, I like to start with another poet's poem, typically. I've been thinking a lot, as we're all social distancing, about work, the nature of work, unpaid work versus paid work, um, and how that always uh, sort of organizes our lives, but it's so much more apparent in a different way now that so many of us are at home. Uh, so this first poem is by Susan Griffin, and it's called Three Poems for a Woman. This is a poem for a woman doing dishes. This is a poem for a woman doing dishes. It must be repeated. It must be repeated again and again, again and again because the woman doing dishes, because the woman doing dishes has trouble hearing, has trouble hearing. Two, and this is another poem for a woman cleaning the floor who cannot hear at all let us have a moment of silence for a woman who cleans the floor. Three. And here is one more poem for the woman at home with children. You never see her at night. Stare at an empty place and imagine her there. The woman with children, because she cannot be here to speak for herself and listen to what you think she might say. So that was by Susan Griffin. Um, and now I'm going to read my own work. Uh, I'm going to read sections of a long poem. This is a 13 page poem, but don't worry, I won't read the whole thing. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm somewhere around 11 minutes with this. I've timed myself. It's called Malacology. The summer after the 2008 financial crash, I found myself working as a cook and cleaner at a family camp in northern Minnesota. Tommy, the director, taught us how to tie knots and drive the pontoon boat. 
rescue drowning swimmers and perform CPR. We stayed in rustic cabins on Star Island in the headwaters of the Mississippi. So far north, we spent nights laid out on the dock looking for the northern lights. If you wanted, you could, in theory, take a raft from Star Island all the way to New Orleans and beyond. This was a fantasy for me then. It was the summer after my first year of college. Though I couldn't prove that there were monsters like Kraken or mermaids in the Mississippi River, I couldn't prove that they weren't there either. The word kraken comes from the same root as crook or crank, a root used to indicate a certain sense of wrongness or that something is awry, monstrous, bent. That summer, I worked with a number of recent college grads who would struggle to find jobs back home. Nobody was hiring in the late summer of 2009. The economy flooded with subprime related bankruptcies, deceitful deals, companies built on structurally compromised rafts of reeds. These days, I am 29. And one of my secret jokes, though I've never said it aloud, is, whoops, I forgot to have children. It reminds me of a bumper sticker. Sorry I didn't go to church. I've been busy practicing witchcraft and becoming a lesbian, of which my sister once said, that describes you perfectly, except for the lesbian part. But eventually, that became a somewhat fitting descriptor, too. Eric Pontopaiden, a Norwegian bishop, believed in the 18th century in the existence of crakes, kraken, and mermaids. He published a book called The Natural History of Norway, defending his position. Some think that beliefs in the kraken's existence linked to sightings of giant squid in global seas. The kraken is also called a crabfish. As far reaching as the Great Recession, they are seldom understood, though they live all over the world. Much of what humans know about giant squid is based on dead specimens washed ashore. Pro-cyclical human nature predatory lending, financial sector concentration, interest rates, subprime mortgages, overproduction, oil prices. Wikipedia possesses a long list of potential causes of the economic crash. Those of us who didn't truly enter the job market until later got lucky some of my friends from camp lived with their parents for years after our time together, working menial jobs they hated, their college degrees seemingly meaning almost nothing. I am a part of the gig economy. I've been a content writer, a copy editor, an AmeriCorps member, an errand runner. I've done events, worked as an artist in residence, a babysitter, a product tester, a popcorn packer, a gardener. I've been a poet for hire, a sustainable fish farmer, a resume editor, a website editor, a blog editor, a grant writer, a personal assistant, a volunteer coordinator, a tutor, a teacher. I've tried to work with writing as much as I possibly could. Telling you this tells you something about my class. I have not been a janitor, a food service worker, a bartender, a factory employee. I have not worked construction or landscaping, fast food, or as a sex worker. I haven't worked third shift, second shift, or first shift, not full time. For a long time, I dated and lived with a woman who made more money in a year than I've made in the last four. When I left her, she wrote me a check to help me get a new studio apartment, like alimony, and I cannot say I declined it. For the first year I was in grad school, my mom sent me money every month. Even so, I was struggling to pay my bills, self-insistent I not work too many hours so I could focus on my creativity. What a luxury. 
I would laugh to people about how I didn't have a car anymore, didn't want to drive on the harrowing roads of Miami, but part of me secretly wished for one. And part of me wanted to ask other students, were their parents giving them money to how much the contradictory nature of receiving free help and still not having enough, the twin shames of it? But being sure, couched in class privilege, that more money is on its mysterious way to the point that one doesn't actually try to get a regular job, not a ticket taker, a dishwasher, a security guard, a person who unfolds tables for special events, not a car washer or a CNA who bathes other people's grandparents at a nursing home. As a child, I watched the end of a movie with my grandfather about a group of soldiers who died on a submerged submarine in World War II. The scene ends with the men singing together, holding hands as the submersible fills to the top, past their chins and beyond, in and with the sea. Some jobs, make you feel like a conscripted scuba diver, gloves and boots connected to a chrome bolted suit, all awkward helmet and wristwatch, a developed fear of the bends, knowing you must be self-reliant to regulate your healthy ascent back to the waves. A scuba diver sent to do some company's bidding a scuba diver relying on herself. I would have worked as a rideshare driver, but I didn't have a car. I applied to be a bicycle delivery girl for a submarine sandwich company, and I even got the job, but I never called back the regional manager. I have a friend who believes she lived a past life in Atlantis. I have a friend whose family lost the house they bought in 2006. I have a cousin who's an engineer, and after graduating, she could not find a job for years. I have a cousin who's an architect, and she was born in 1980, already 28 when the market crashed, and she endured her share of struggles too. I have a cousin who works in the tides, harvesting wild oysters in the waters of Washington. Sometimes he calls me on his walk <laughs> to work and I can hear him sloshing. He works at night, during the day, double shifts whenever the moon cooperates. I have a friend who's foregone higher education because it would put her into further debt. I have many friends in further debt. I have multiple friends who say they don't know why they got PhDs. I have a friend who confessed he is addicted to video games. I have many friends, in fact, who struggle with the disease of addiction. I have a friend who hasn't taught sober. I have a cousin <coughs> who works as a substitute teacher. I have a cousin who's a scientific researcher. I have a cousin who's built a successful career as a car mechanic, and recently his arm was badly burned at work. I have a friend from high school who isn't allowed to come out. I have a friend who lived with her mother even after nursing school. Many of my friends are marrying people whom I also hope remain friends. These years are my era of weddings, big ones and small ones, queer ones and straight ones and latently queer queer ones all over the circum-antarctic ocean, colossal squids, cephalopods let their beaks guide them. Some giant squid are eaten by whales. The Wikipedia entry for colossal squid says the largest specimen ever found was initially thought to be a male. However, closer inspection of the specimen showed it to be a female. Sex is important to researchers. 
The flesh of giant squid seems to be reddish pink. And I can barely find pictures of giant squid online. Though living in Miami, a warming city on an apparent oceanic descent, I suppose I know the direction I would swim in in order to find other crakes. Inaccurate credit ratings, regulatory avoidance, mortgage compensation model, the shadow banking system, net capital rule, the US housing bubble, lovers of sushi, my partner and I decided we would no longer eat octopus after we watched videos demonstrating their intelligence. Octopi reminded us of humans and we are not shipwrecked or stranded, not last resort cannibals on Campton Franklin's damned expedition. We both feel disquiet about eating any kind of seafood these days, though once a year we drive to South Beach to eat stone crabs when Wendy and Mary come to town. I was born in 1990, a firm initiate of that millennial generation. Last summer, I asked my students, 18 and 19 and 20, aren't you millennials? A silent beat. They looked at me like I was a kraken leading the class. We are Gen Z, the students shouted in a fragmented chorus, an android vibrating on one person's desk. And just like that, fast as a tail snaps back into water, I was no longer a younger young adult. Almost 30, I was aging. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frisia, for that very thoughtful piece. Thank you. Okay, next up is Naoko Fujimoto. Naoko was born and raised in Nagoya, Japan. She's the author of Where I Was Born, winner of the Editor's Choice by Willow Books and Glyph Graphic Poetry Equals Trans Sensory by Tupelo Press. Her chapbooks, Mother Said, I Want Your Pain, winner of the Shared Dream Immigrant Contest by Backbone Press, Silver Seasons of Heartache by Glass Liar Press, Home No Home, winner of the annual Orofino chapbook competition by Edis Press, are also available from each press. So please go ahead and support the poet. Her most recent publications are in Poetry, Kenyon Review, The Seattle Review, Diode Poetry Journal, and Pank. She is a Rhino Poetry Associate Editor. And for more about Naoko, you can visit her website, naokofujimoto.com. Naoko, the stage is yours. Thank you. Wow, Freestia, it was a powerful poem. I need to kind of disappear. <laughs> Digest it. Um, wow, wow. It was it was amazing long poem. Thank you very much for sharing this. Yeah. So okay. All right, all right. So first um I am very thankful. The Betsy Hotel. Miami Beach, Auburn Studio, Florida International University, Swim in Miami, Jen, Catherine, Caridad, John, Deborah, Colette, and the wonderful Felicia. Because of you guys, writers and artists can pass our torches to next generation, even though we are facing a difficult time. So thank you very much. Thank you. So tonight, I was thinking of a special way to have this live event. I wanted to do something only I can do from my living room here. So I decorated this wall, and then I'm super happy to show my graphic poem, large piece here. And the poems in their original printed magazines and journal, they, it's a, some of them, it's a hard to, you know, it's very heavy to carry them. And then actually, I have a piano here.
so I am tonight, I'm going to read seven poems. So my first poem, Puerto del Sol. I hope I that pronounced it right. This is my very first publication in 2009. Before the sunset, your skipping stone glides around as if a flying fish crosses from ocean to ocean, shines its scales. The ocean fills up with acidic sentiments. You give me the smoothest, orchidest stone with the dirt, but the best kind of skipping stone. I throw horizontally by dives and splashes. The waves ripple, my tears dribble into the ocean. I wasted your stone. I waste another stone. I waste. I rest, but when you find a new one and gently hold the stone in my hand, our palms lie together like the valve. It carries a pearl gray hope. Before sunset, I skip my stone once and again. A lamp comes on in a house, a star fragments the western sky. For the second poem, I would like to share my most recent publication, Kenyan Review, in 2019. After my 10 years of progress, you can enjoy listening to how my poems develop. Low of it. This restless woman walks back and forth, more like a hamster rattling in a small wheel in an invisible cage. I wonder if she lives in a mirrored dome stretching throughout an accordion tube. So she does not see what I see. When I say good morning, she turns her back and waves the back of her hand. After a few feet, she turns around again and walks toward my yard. In my bathroom, with my chin resting on my hands, I wonder how she defines freedom. I know she's not captured in a space pod where it takes 45 minutes to ship, appropriated into a small bag in microgravity. I don't know. I'm willing to go outside of the Earth where we are so stupidly helpless. Does she feel that way here? Outside of her country, her husband drives their only car back late, full of white plastic bags. Can you only view? So I've been working on the futuristic space theme the Seattle Review kindly published a 14 pages poem of mine in their newest issue. And then I read it at one of my reading events recently, but I'm not, but I'm not sure this is a good idea to read it tonight with my soothing Japanese accent. So just a showing. Ah, da, da. The Poetry Magazine! Yay! <laughs> I'm a I'm, I'm very awkward person, as usual. And this is the... I heard this is probably the first uh, uh, time having fold out in a poetry magazine, Lake Michigan. It's a graphic poetry of mine. And actually here is the, my original one. It's a, pretty big. So I'm going to read Lake Michigan from my chapbook. Mother said I want your pain. Lake Michigan. No crumbs bubbles to step on the lake beach. 
Waves just come and go. No seaweed, no fisherman's nets. Plastic cups tumble, but no dead coral. Lifeguards freckle the shoulders. Nobody screams, jellyfish. Wind tosses my hair across my mouth. I taste nothing like standing by seashore near a beach house. Rusted roofs. You sweated and wanted to name the baby Yume. I said dream and I did not like it. To a farm of white. Crowds stretch. Maybe you knew, first breath almost. So I am currently associate editor and outreach translation editor at Rhino Poetry Forum. This is our 2020 issue. And then I uh, designed this cover art for this year. And this is a gag reel. Uh, I made a significant mistake, the thickest issue. Apparently, it was not the thickest issue, even though we read so many submissions, but it's a good thing. So I'd like to say we are celebrating our first global online reading event, hashtag RhinoSight2020. You can see our contributors reading through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So please visit the Rhino's website or Facebook page to see more information. So before I was the um, editor, I was contributor in 2017 they are off. Fabulous poet in this issue as well. So I'm going to read my poem from here. Enough is never. I will take the trash out, he says. The door closes in a small house. Our hearts, like reverbs, liquidate in a garbage disposal. Magpie brings pieces from the glass company, adding more stones to the river bank. I grew my deodorant in his cabinet, because enough is never enough. Hair upholster my eyes on his sheets. Orange toenails, he says. I slip my feet under his thighs. We hear. Her lovely laugh, a neighborhood girl raises her sunglasses with the freckles on her clavicles, her white dress flares. I am going to read three more poems from my corrections. They are pretty depressive, depressing. I cheer you up before my reading. <laughs> That's the three poems. On the beach. I burn the upright piano. Blazing plumage. My fingertip scaled, but I must finish my rhapsody. Sand of primrose shells. The eggshells, the yolk, veins of a medium boiled egg. I hate it. I want it in your eyes. Your eyes, morning star, my brain out of tune. The strings smolder, the chair scorches, and my skirt flames. Ashen feathers fly. These white pieces return to home, home toward the horizon. In 17 seconds, the sun will be gone. My first marriage is kidding itself. 
but it is not my fault. Your hidden bottle under the bookshelf, Hanemon suitcase empty whiskey. When you want to eat ground beef, I stir the frozen meat into miso soup and hysterically commit plates. Maybe partially my fault. If I earn enough money, if I bring a box of brown rice to the table, if I pay rent, if my marriage is a green card, I am not overdosing on painkillers. You watch TV and then cat in turn, you say, be aware of my cocoon period, darling. My last four. The explosion of ivy leaves. Then I hate, I hate the explosion of ivy leaves. Since puberty, I should have known better. Holding his hand under the dinner table, or whispering, and finding a gray hair behind his ear does not mean anything. I smell the ice beaded Michigan beach. A wild animal hibernates until its mating season. Tweezers and the pliers net my heart. You know, I am actually happy. I have an Afghan to cover my feet. On the couch, a black cat jumps. She pries off her transparent nails on my naked knees. With the noise of a reality television show, I am smoldering young in the worst way, never learned how to kiss in a winter rain. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naoko. Thank you. Very moving. Thank you. Fun to listen to. Now I'm going to hand it over to Jen. Jen, uh, do we have any questions or any comments or what do we want to talk about? I have a question. I actually have a question for um, Frisia. Um, how long is it in total and how long did it take you to write? Um, I think it's, th it's 13 pages. That must be the magic number. Um, and it took me to do the initial draft. It, took four or five days of like being consumed by it. And so I actually went to a reading queer event, um, which is a Miami literary organization, another great organization in our ecosystem. And like in that span of time, and I was excited to go and work on other stuff, but then it, this poem, it was like halfway in progress and it was just like totally stuck in my head. And so it was the first time where I felt like the poem had me like this. And it was like, you gotta, you gotta finish me, you gotta finish me. Uh, so that was a new, a new experience. So Naoko, you also have a very long poem, a 14 page poem. Yes. You have a similar experience with that? Yeah, uh, but I, I cannot finish within one week, <laughs> like a free set in. But um, mine is more like uh, um, half a year, one year, piling up, and then kind of construct. So two very different experiences with long poems. Long yeah. poems are very interesting, I think, for a lot of us. You know, they either they either happen or they don't. Exactly. I I really loved uh, Felicia's poem. She has uh, so many things going on. However, all the bits of every episode is connected with a very strong spine. That's very difficult to manage that so I, I, I was really moved I wish I didn't read after <laughs> but I really wanted to kind of soak into her reading a little bit more well I think also like your work has that really associative quality of like these really satisfying leaps and like making connections that like I that I hadn't like thought of before um, and so I think I mean that's one of the one of the like gifts of the long poem, right, is like, yes and this, yes and this, like let's keep throwing stuff in here and see how it connects. 
Okay, so I have a question for one or both of you. This can either, let's have both of you answer it. Um, thank you for bringing your creative light to this day, which I think we all need some creativity at this point in our lives, so it is a blessing. Um, the question is, what has women's creative community meant to you? So we can start, whoever wants, sorry, I'm, I'm slapping bugs out here, but that has <laughs> Um, whoever wants to answer that first, feel free to jump in. What has the women's creative community meant to you? I mean, I think, do you want to go first, Naoko? No, go ahead, go ahead, Mishli. I feel like for me, it's been everything. Like, I feel like that's where my, the whole point of this is about voice and, um, and sharing space and, I was a gender and women's studies major as an undergrad, wasn't a creative writing major or anything. So I think that's, that infuses everything. And um, yeah, that's my answer. I think the answer to that is very long. That's a good prompt for a poem. <laughs> good prompt. It's an excellent question. So thank you for bringing that to us. Naoko? Yes, I, I often think, what, why? was I born as a girl or woman, female? Why I was not boy? And I came here, America, when I was 19, and I didn't speak English at all. And I am Asian female. So a lot, I didn't really realize, but I, I had a lot of discrimination. That's my friends told me, but I, I don't really remember. So... I've been thinking about being a woman through my, you know, pet years. But then I'm very thankful. Women has a more beautifully strong will and very stubborn. And I love that fact. And of course, men is good as well. But sometimes that kind of like volcano in the you know in the core of the mountain kind of energy creates great art poetry that's when i think about that i am so thankful and happy to be part of a female art writing literature community so swim miami i always follow you guys twitters facebook I love listening to you guys' voices and you are, you are writers and poets. So thank you very much for thank you. writing us. Yeah, we love, we love having you. It's great for us. It's a, it's a, it's a privilege for us. Okay, next thank question you. is for Frisia. I love your use of lists in your long poem as a way to subvert the narrative arc. How do you manage, choose, and order items for your lists? It's a very good question. Is there a secret logic or rhyme or reason to this process? And it's true, you had, you had several of those lists in that poem, and you probably have more since we didn't get to hear all of it, but it is an interesting way to extend the narrative and also subvert it, and it's like an interesting plot device in a long narrative poem. So maybe you can speak on that for a second. Yeah, that's a really great question. So I'm thinking a lot about pattern and I think kind of transferring our like musical listening knowledge into this, like music is all about a series, creating a series of patterns, creating texture between patterns and a list is a pattern. You're building a pattern with every item in that list. Um, so, so that's, I mean, I think, Poetry also relies on patterns. It's also a musical art form. Um, so creating the pattern and then breaking it strategically um, helps you kind of like steer the vehicle of the poem, I think. Um, so, you know, you can also build tension within that pattern, right? Like the, the, um, the reader thinks, okay, yeah, I know what's going on. Like we've had 13 of these, you know, we've had 14 of these. And then you're like, wait a minute, we're going in a different direction, right? And that provokes an emotional response because I'm no neuroscientist, but I think like then the brain has to shift, right? Wait a minute, we're on a different track. Um, so I think that works well in a long poem, especially because 
you have to sustain the reader's interest for so many pages. So really paying close, I'm, I'm trying and sometimes very often failing, I think occasionally succeeding in trying to um, be very conscious about like what, like what kind of drive am I taking the, the reader on? Um, and am I like keeping it interesting? Right, are you going on, a, on an urban drive? Are you going on a rural drive? Are you combining them? Right. Yeah, that I think it's I think it's a challenge to write long poems, and you've both done it, so that's it's a pretty interesting question. So the next question is actually for Naoko. Um, we've seen you play piano, so we know that you, <laughs> um, which obviously translates to poetry. Your poems have a very musical quality, and you also read them very musically, and your voice is also very musical. So, what role does music play in your process? That's a very good question. Music is always part of my life uh, since I was young. I'm thanks to my parents. Mm -hmm. They gave me, um, a, you know, piano lessons since I, you know, I was three years, four years old, a baby. So, you know, Raf Rafmaninoff. Rafmaninoff has a like adagio, and then it's uh, if you Google it, you can listen to Rafmaninoff everywhere. I think he's a great example. He has a one phrase, like, like a landing spot of his music, like, Too. so when I creating, composing my poems, I try to have that kind of landing spot, like smooth musical landing spot. That's, that's always in my head. So like in composition, you have certain arcs. Mm -hmm. Certain, like a phrase in a way, like, what's this, the yeah, soothing? Like awards, yeah. very. Uh, that's very interesting. Okay, so the next question is for both poets. Either one of you can jump in here. Um, I am a fiction writer and academic writer. How would one who lives in prose get into poetry? Oh, you're gonna love this one, especially since it's so hard to define what a poem is. So this is great for both of you because you work in very different ways even if you work in traditional poems you have graphic poetry you have long poems you have music in your poems so you guys can answer this any way you want um but this is an interesting question for both of you oh yeah i go first to be Felicia first the last time so um i think it's the um three major things about poetry title line breaks mm. and Tempo. Mm -hmm. So, if if you are com like, for example, converting a fiction short story into poetry, it's a hard thing to do. But it's not possible if you pick up the right title, and then line break. So you read your pieces million times to see is this a good right, you know, place to stop, and then go next line and the line break, and then. Poetry, sometimes you don't need to explain everything. So like, for example, oh, this morning I wash my face, brush my teeth, and then I put the lipstick on. You don't have to say that. You can skip all the details and then dive into the conclusion. So if you have a, those three points, I think um, you, you may write a poem, poetry. Yeah. Can you address that too? Yeah, that's such a good answer. I think um, this, the idea of space is very um, important. And so fragments, space, and compression, which is like another term to throw into the mix. And I think also, like, I love that question that can't be answered about what is a poem, what isn't. Like, it's a totally unanswerable question. And it's like, the negative capability thing of like, I don't know, I'm just gonna like sit in this question for a long time, for my entire life. Um, I think like writing into that gray area could be really interesting for a prose writer. So to do things like write prose poems um, or, or other like short forms, I think, where you're not even sure what exactly it is, um, micro memoir, all of that kind of stuff. And I think also um, emulation, so looking at poets and trying to figure out what they're doing and then write a poem where you're trying to do the same similar thing. 
Um, and then also like working in forms can be really instructive too and kind of change the way that you are working. So um, putting yourself into the perhaps uncomfortable position of like writing a sonnet, writing a villanelle, writing a haiku. And so if you feel like, I don't know what the rules are of poetry, like the rules are right there already in the form that can kind of help you get into that space. Very, very good answers, I think, both of you, because for one thing, I think, you know, 20 years ago, the answers might have been a little different. Like, here, this is a poem, this is what it is, we have defined it. Um, but with a lot of the hybrid and experimentation that has gone on, things have changed, and we can define it a little bit differently now, or maybe say, like you said, the gray areas are different, um, and we can explore more, and maybe it's not, there's not, not so much definition. It's a little fuzzier. Mm -hmm. So prose bleeds into poetry. And if you want to write poetry and you're not sure what it is, you know, let the gates open, right? And try. So, okay, so the next question. Thank you to both of you for these wonderful readings. Fabulous. This is a question for Naoko. What is your process for creating visual poetry? Excellent question. Um, do the words and the visuals develop together or does one part follow the other? Yeah, this question is actually very popular. Everybody asked me and then I said, yeah, I write my fir first draft in uh, Egyptian hieroglyph or something. And then like, what? No, I'm just kidding. I did, <laughs> I did write in both Japanese and English. My mother's tongue, my first language is Japanese. So Japanese is much comfortable. And then as you know, Japanese literature have a lot of visual related li literature, like a haiku, very minimum, you know, minimalistic attitude. However, you have a, you know, explore a lot of images beyond of the world. So my, I, when I compose a graphic poem, I always, discuss myself, is this word necessary? Or is this words should be image instead? So this is the, my process. I always ask my question over and over and over, word versus image or both. Mm -hmm. That's the, my um, process. I think I answered? <laughs> I think for people who don't do graphic poetry, mm -hmm. that's probably very unknown to them. And that's why they ask you that all the time, especially for people who don't think visually. And that's why they, they say, you know, what comes first? It's a chicken or egg question for people who do both, right? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, but you know, it's uh, arts always have a freedom to express and you know, a lot of people, to, uh, you know, approach me, oh, I never thought I am allowed to do graphic poem. Like, of course you are allowed, you know? And um, it's actually very fun. And then also, you can see your poetry, written poetry, much closer. So like a kind of a, you are having your, you have your own editor in, in your site because you are constantly, you know, asking and questioning yourself, is this necessary word or just is a necessary image or both? So it's a good for your, you know, editorial skills as well. Right. Okay. Um, does anybody have any last questions or are we done with the questions? In which case I will hand it over to Carrie and she will tell us what's going to happen next week. Um, Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here with us on our inaugural reading. Um, we're very excited. Thank you to Naoko and Frisia. You guys were really amazing. And it was um, my joy and pleasure to be a part of this just wonderful event. Um, I want to take a minute to let everybody know if while you're still on, you have the opportunity to download the entire transcript of tonight's reading. Um, but you have to do that before you exit Zoom. If you, if you find yourself not able to do that now and want to later, you can access tonight's recording on Facebook Live. And um, it has been recorded with the closed captioning available. So it is accessible and available to you whenever you need it to be. 
Um, next week, we're going to have Mia Leonin and Alexandra Leighton Regalado, um, two incredibly dynamic, talented women, and we are so excited to have them join us next week. Um, I'm going to pass it off now to Deb, who has some parting words for us. And thanks again for being with us, the swim team. We're just so excited and thrilled to be able to bring us uh, into your homes and have you come into ours and share this, this global virtual space. It's so heartwarming for all of us. Thank you for joining us tonight. Deb? Let me just unmute Deborah. Uh, un unmute, are you there Deborah? Hi, can you hear me? We know outer, outer space has kind of taken you over, it seems. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm, I can't be seen anymore, but well, I can We don't be know what's happening. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to thank everyone for coming tonight. It is a little eerie that my face has disappeared on the screen. Um, but um, just so you know, uh, this is our fifth salon. We've had about 500 households uh, join us. Um, and I hope next time you might consider inviting a friend, somebody that you might not have seen, uh, and so that if you watch in your respective homes, you'd have something new to talk about together. So we just wanted to suggest that to you. And when we send you your access next time, please feel free to share it with a friend or family member. So thanks once again for coming, everyone. We really appreciate it. John, did gonna, you want to say anything else? I was just going to thank everybody, too. I love these because they're not webinars. They're live. We Things happen. We don't all have not pre-programmed everything. I love the conversation because it kind of, takes on its own life and like the way we couldn't see any of those words, Naoko, but the fact that you were flashing those books in front of us was so interesting and appealing and, and uh, I thought it very, uh, very poetic. Anyway, um, what we do at the end of these is we, sh as we unmute everybody for a minute to clap and then, and then we'll say good night to everybody um, and we'll just leave it at that. So I'm unmuting and uh, welcoming you all to thank our poets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Thank you all. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Stay safe. Good night. Okay, I'll be waiting for you because you're the best. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, John. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. No, you were terrific. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was Thank you. amazing. It was so, so Great nice. caring. Thank you so much. Wonderful. And Ayoko, I loved your segues. It was wonderful. Uh, wonderful. So <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm glad you enjoy it. Yeah, Thank very you. much. You both so talented. Thank you so I much. I need a little entertainment. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Uh, yeah. Good night. Until we can enjoy it. Cheers. Good night, guys. Good night. Cheers. Good night, y'all. Bye.